Are we living in a computer simulation? Elon Musk and many other influential thinkers tend to think yes. But first, you need to understand our place in the cosmos and also how spirituality ties in. Try to imagine what it will be like to go to sleep and never wake up. Now try to imagine what it was like to wake up having never gone to sleep. Alan Watts. And that, my friends, is where we find ourselves now, in this strange cosmic mystery. We have no idea how we got here. We have no idea where we're heading next or what happens after death. We're also in a gigantic universe. You are now looking at the deepest ever image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. There are 125 billion galaxies visible in the universe. The Milky Way has around 100 billion stars or maybe as high as 400 billion in some estimates. The largest galaxy known has near 100 trillion stars. In this image, the smallest red galaxies are furthest away. The furthest one is one of those red dots in the upper right hand portion of the screen and it is 13.4 billion light years away. We are looking into the past. Every time you look up into the sky, you're looking back in time. The moon is 1.5 seconds in the past. The sun is 8 minutes and 20 seconds into the past. The sun could have exploded 7 minutes ago and you would still not even know it. Much is unknown in this universe. We truly are living in a cosmic mystery. From the official nasa.gov website, more is unknown than is known. We know how much dark energy there is because we know how it affects the universe's expansion. Other than that, it is a complete mystery, but it is an important mystery. It turns out that roughly 68% of the universe is dark energy. Dark matter makes up about 27%. The rest, everything on Earth, everything ever observed with all our instruments, all normal matter, adds up to less than 5% of the universe. And as I always say, we're barely beyond cavemen. We think we're so special with all our technology, our phones, our computers, our vehicles. It's all barely getting off the ground. Neil deGrasse Tyson has commented on dark energy and dark matter. He said so on uh, Joe Rogan and another source that I found. He says, we don't know what they are. So those names are misleading. We should just call them Fred and Wilma instead because that would be just as accurate as calling them dark matter and dark energy. I paraphrased a bit, but that's the sum of it. Scientists have no idea. Some scientists believe that dark energy and dark matter are a part of the same phenomenon. It's not clear. Brian Greene, he's the physicist who started the World Science Festival. I highly recommend that on YouTube if you haven't checked it out. He explains that dark matter, remember it's 27% of the universe, dark matter holds galaxies together. Think about a bike tire in the rain. This was his brilliant analogy in one of his videos on YouTube. The rotation causes the water to shoot out away from the center of the tires. Sometimes you get it all over your back, sometimes it, it shoots off a little bit further away. But that's not what you see in galaxies. These galaxies are spinning 
and dark matter is holding them in place, this mysterious force. Dark energy, the 68%, is increasing the expansion rate of the universe. Everything continues to fly away from the source, the Big Bang. We all come from the same source. Like I said, humanity is practically blind in this universe. We barely have any vision into what's going on. And it's strange how we can continue to worry about the future and to continue to worry about things. This reminds me of the great Terence McKenna. He said, we don't know enough to worry. He, he said it was a sense of hubris for humans to actually think that we know enough about the nature of this world to worry. I mean, we could be living in a simulation, seriously. And more on that's coming up in the near future in this video, so stick around. Uh, I mean, we know little of the vastness of the universe. We barely have explored anything in our own oceans on planet Earth. Our own backyard, the Milky Way, has hundreds of billions of stars that it's ridiculous. We can not even explore our own backyard. We don't know anything. So we need to continue to have an open mind and continue to evolve as this new information comes out, whatever new information science reveals. So we know little of the experiences of psychedelic drugs like DMT and psilocybin mushrooms and LSD. People experience some very deep and wild things on these drugs. That's not the focus of this video, but since I brought up Terrence McKenna, I sort of had to bring that up. So, anyways, in part two of this series, this is only part one. Part two is going to be covering near-death experiences and all sorts of other wild stuff. This was a little side tangent. All right, back to it. This is from AliveScience.com article from August 23rd, 2021, written by an astrophysicist named Paul Sutter. Multiverse theory suggests that our universe, with all its hundreds of billions of galaxies and almost countless stars, spanning tens of billions of light years, may not be the only one. Instead, there may be an entirely different universe distantly separated from ours, and another, and another. Indeed, there may be an infinity of universes, all with their own laws of physics, their own collections of stars and galaxies, if stars and galaxies can exist in those universes, and maybe even their own intelligent civilizations. Paul Sutter. The cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Carl Sagan. Your body has roughly seven octillion atoms. All are billions of years old. You literally are the universe experiencing itself. I mentioned Neil deGrasse Tyson earlier, the brilliant astrophysicist. In his more recent version of Cosmos, he had the brilliant idea of reducing the 13.8 billion years that the universe has existed into a more manageable way of understanding. He reduced it down to the single calendar year and he kept the ratios the same. So this way you can understand just how short of a time period humanity has been here in this universe. The first cave paintings from humans happened in the last minute of the year on December 31st. Science has only appeared in the last second of the year. So humanity and science are two of the newest creations in this universe.
Albert Einstein wanted to have a theory of everything, but he was not able to accomplish this in his lifespan. He did come up with the theory of relativity, you know, the famous E equals MC squared. But since he came up short, that left future generations to solve this problem. Right now, the leading theory is called string theory. Michio Kaku is one of the creators of string theory. They are basically trying to put everything in existence into an equation that wouldn't even be that long. According to many string theorists, there may be as high as 10 or 11 dimensions in this universe. One estimate is that there might even be as high of a number as 26 dimensions. Remember, we've only perceived less than 5% of reality. We're barely beyond cavemen. The chance that higher life forms might have emerged through evolutionary processes is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the material therein, Fred Hoyle. Now he's an astronomer and a panspermia advocate, but he didn't invent it. And basically panspermia is the theory that fully formed bacteria is able to travel through space on asteroids, comets, stardust, or anything else that's floating around out there. Francis Crick, a molecular biologist and biophysicist, he cracked the code on DNA along with another, and he proposed that aliens seeded our planet on purpose. From a March 18th, 2021 news story, there were four bacteria strains found inside the International Space Station. Three were new, and one was a bacteria strain known from Earth. More shockingly, in 2020, Japanese researchers found that pellets of dried bacteria stuck to the exterior of the station were able to survive in space for more than three years. The average temperature in space is negative 455 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's negative 270 Celsius. What you're about to see is how some of the greatest scientific minds of all time have been saying things that match up almost identically with some of the greatest spiritual teachers of all time. You will hear things from Tesla and Einstein, and it's shocking how they match up with what the spiritual teachers have been saying for thousands of years. I believe in Spinoza's God who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with fates and actions of human beings. Albert Einstein. And I wasn't too familiar with Spinoza, but I looked him up because that's what Einstein was talking about. Here's what Spinoza meant by that. It summarizes it pretty well. God is not he who is, but that which is. Baruch Spinoza. And a little background on him. He's a philosopher who was born in Amsterdam, 1632 AD, but he was of a Portuguese background and he was raised with a type of Judaism. He became ostracized from his Jewish community and the Christian community due to his views and he wound up moving away later. So here's a quote from Einstein where he was being criticized and lied about on religion. I do not believe in a personal God, and I have never denied this, but have expressed it clearly. If something is in me which can be called religious, then it is the unbounded admiration for the structure of the world so far as our science can reveal it. Albert Einstein. The next quote is going to be from Nikola Tesla, but before that, why not? admire some of his amazing creations. Here's a few Tesla coils. Ah, that was a fun tangent. All right, let's get back to it. For ages, this idea has been proclaimed in the consummately wise teachings of religion. Probably not alone as a means of ensuring peace, 
and harmony among men, but as a deeply founded truth. The Buddhist expresses it one way, the Christian in another, but both say the same. We are all one. Nikola Tesla. A human being is part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole nature in its beauty. Albert Einstein And next we have a quote from the spiritual teacher who's had the greatest impact on my life and that's Eckhart Tolle. You are not in the universe, you are the universe, an intrinsic part of it. Ultimately, you are not a person, but a focal point where the universe is becoming conscious of itself. What an amazing miracle, Eckhart Tolle. Through our eyes, the universe is perceiving itself. Through our ears, the universe is listening to its harmonies. We are the witnesses through which the universe becomes conscious of its glory, of its magnificence. Alan Watts. And now we get to hear a quote from Marcus Aurelius, my favorite of all the Stoic philosophers. Frequently consider the connection of things in the universe. We should not say I am an Athenian or I am a Roman, but I am a citizen of the universe. Marcus Aurelius. And now let's mix it up with a quote from the great Bill Hicks. If you're not familiar, he's one of the greatest stand-up comics of all time. But he was great because he had such an amazing mind. He made amazing commentary on the state of humanity and it made his stand-up comedy so unique and so amazing. Please, if you have not checked him out, be sure to check him out. All matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration that we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There is no such thing as death, life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. Bill Hicks. And here is probably the most controversial quote of the entire presentation, but I agree 100%. Carl Sagan, back to him again. How is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought. The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. Instead they say, no, 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 my God is a little God and I want him to stay that way. A religion, old or new, that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Carl Sagan. So as far as we can tell, we are all one. We're all one consciousness experiencing itself from different points of view. It is selfish to be kind to others because as you will see in part two of this series, which I will put out sometime later, part two is gonna cover near death experiences and how one man in particular, Danny and Brinkley, who had multiple lightning strike near death experiences, how he only experienced himself judging himself. And there wasn't a God entity that was separate from, from him. He experienced the pain of everybody he ever hurt. You experience that pain from their point of view. But he also stressed that you experience all the good things you've ever done to anybody or for anybody as well. And so hopefully you're going to have a, a better experience than a worse experience if that is in fact what happens in the afterlife. So make sure you hit the like button, hit uh, subscribe, make sure you hit that bell button, get every notification. And uh, the more you comment as well and interact, I will definitely try my best to interact with you guys. And it really helps the channel if you do that. So please hit that up. Thank you very much. This is my first video. So 
Much love to you guys, and I hope you stick around. Stimulation theory is the theory that everything in the universe is being run by an advanced computer. That includes your life, my life, every animal you've ever seen, and everything in the universe that I just showed you. The man who invented this theory is named Nick Bostrom. He's a modern philosopher who put all the pieces together in his theory in 2003. He thinks it's only a 20% chance of us being in a computer simulation. The other possibilities are humans or human-like entities went extinct or they decided not to make the simulations because they were morally wrong. After all, you'd be creating a lot of suffering for those who are in the simulation who feel like it's actually reality, which could be what we're experiencing now. Elon Musk's public opinions about it made it more popular than ever. He said on stage at one event, the odds that we are in base reality is one in billions. Elon and his brother had to make it a rule that if they were ever in a hot tub together, there's no talk of simulation theory allowed because they've talked about it so much. 2022 is the 50th anniversary of when Pong came out, the first video game. Of course, it's very pathetic looking with two little paddles going like that and this little pathetic pixelated ball bouncing around between and very primitive little number score things going. But think about how far we've come. Pong came out 50 years ago, just about. And we now have Cyberpunk. If you've played it on a high-end computer like I've been able to, I mean, it is just ridiculous how far games have come. Now you also have online role-playing games where you have people playing simultaneously together all over the world. There's an astronomer named David Kipping. He says, the day we invent that technology, and he's referring to simulation technology, it flips the odds from a little bit better than 50-50 that we are real to almost certainly that we are not real, according to these calculations. It'd be a very strange celebration of our genius that day. Now, of course, Kipping could be right. I mean, look at how humanity is always at war with each other and look how we're fighting constantly. The nuclear weapons of today are 3,000 times stronger than the ones that were dropped on Japan. Plus, you got China with their supersonic technology where they're shooting missiles into space. They're undetectable. They could strike any city in the world anytime they want. And China, of course, is threatening to take over Taiwan by force. So we are definitely in a dangerous situation. There's no guarantees that humanity can make it out of this. There's a bunch of other things that could go wrong as well, like Yellowstone going off, a giant solar flare that could wipe out the electricity to the entire planet. It could be another extinction event, just like what the dinosaurs went through. Of course, there's the Fermi paradox, and that basically asks, where's the aliens? And it's very possible that when aliens get, aliens or humans or whatever, get into this stage of their development where they lack wisdom and they have all the technology to war with each other and end the world, well, what do you expect? There's a possibility it could happen to us. And it's a, there's a possibility it's already happened to them. I still think the overwhelming odds show that we're living in a simulation. I agree with Elon on this one. Speaking of Elon Musk, his company Neuralink has been at the forefront of merging man with machine. His Neuralink tech was surgically put into a monkey's brain and he was able to play the game Pong at a pretty high level with his mind and intention alone. I can't show it here for copyright reasons, so enjoy some humorous monkey videos instead as I explain. First, they started by calibrating his brain with the computer by recording the electrical activity in the monkey's brain. He used a joystick and had a screen in front of him. He had to place the cursor into a series of glowing boxes in different parts of the screen. They then awarded him with smoothie sips for each correct cursor placement and then decoded the data in a nearby computer. Shortly after, he played Pong at a high level just by imagining or intending the paddle moving up or down. 
The video link is going to be in the description of this video, so check that out. Early simulation technology is likely going to be video games, advanced video games. Ones where you're going to have to trick the brain into perceiving what the characters are experiencing in the game. For that reason, I think Neuralink is going to be at the forefront of the earliest of simulation technology. The brain communicates with your muscles and your nerves through electrical activity. We are not so different from computers ourselves. So of course, this Neuralink tech could be a prime interface between the two. We are knocking on the door of quantum computing already. Google's quantum computer is about 158 million times faster than the world's fastest supercomputer. It did a calculation in less than four minutes that would take the world's most powerful computer 10,000 years to do. Remember from that scale from earlier, the Neil deGrasse Tyson one. We're one second into science. Imagine if science is around for even 10 seconds or even 100 seconds. Inconceivable computer power is right around the corner. Here are some of my thoughts on the big picture. The human body acts like a machine. The brain communicates to your nerves and muscles through electrical signals. You take medicine, the same effect happens every time. You eat food or you drink water, you breathe air, and the same effect happens to your body every single time. Now compare that to when you hit the space bar on a computer. The same thing happens all the time. When typing, hitting any letter on the keyboard does the same thing as well. There are many parallels between the human body and computers. So how is it not plausible that we are living in a simulation? Maybe it's more likely that the body is more like an electronic spacesuit just so you could experience life in this world. Like the saying goes, we are not humans having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Since we're in the early phases of understanding this reality that we find ourselves in, I think it's possible that the universe could be directing the events of our lives. It may even be directing the relationships that we have, who we meet and when, who our family members are. When you were born into human form, where and when you were born has been decided for you. All medical conditions may have been decided as well, and all other aspects of your life. Your likes and your dislikes have been chosen for you as well. Everybody loves a good massage, and everybody hates getting punched in the face. Of course, that would cause incentives for you to act out your life in a certain way. What I'm getting at is that maybe seemingly random events are not so random after all. For me, Chronic physical pain has certainly been a guide for me. Without my pain, I would be a completely different person. This channel wouldn't exist. I'd probably just have some typical life and it just never felt like my past. After studying and researching things for over 15 years now, I think it's very possible that we are given the exact life that we have to have in order to further progress our soul or our spirit or whatever word you want to give it whatever it is that makes you you i'm on year 15 of chronic back pain from ankylosing spondylitis and it is messed up i ain't gonna lie but fortunately my symptoms aren't as bad as so many others the evidence seems to point to us all being one at the deepest of levels so be kind always it's selfish to be kind to others in that sense, especially if you consider what may be waiting for you in the afterlife. So this is the end to the first part of this series. There will be at least one more part to this Nature of Reality series, but this is a new channel. I gotta pump out content faster, so I'm gonna have a bunch of cool, but very, very powerful ones coming up next. The next video is probably gonna be about Seneca, the ancient Stoic, and he wrote all sorts of letters to his best friend Lucilius and it is just some of the most important and powerful and relevant things that you could ever learn about today so my favorite one I'm going to cover that next all right as we wrap this up please make sure you subscribe hit the like button comment uh, after hitting subscribe hit that bell button make sure you get every notification uh, also I'm also down for a collaboration I'm interested in making a podcast 
I'm interested in having somebody I could at least have some humor with instead of just staring at the camera by myself. Like, it feels weird, I ain't gonna lie, but it's a necessary evil. And uh, at this point, at least, we'll get there, we'll get there. Uh, so if you're interested, hit me up on my Gmail or on Facebook. All my social media stuff is in the description or in the banner of the channel. And uh, also, I'm not making one penny off of this. I put in a lot of time and effort. So if you want to support the project, uh, hit up my uh, PayPal account. That'll be in the description for sure and probably elsewhere. I haven't made it yet at the time of making this video. Big things are in the works, hopefully. I'd like to do this kind of content forever until I die at least. And uh, yeah, it'll be fun. We'll have good philosophical conversations, a podcast. And I'll leave you with this. Alan Watts used to call himself a spiritual entertainer. Well, I'm more of a spiritual troll. So, I really have a strong comedy side to me. I wanna make inappropriate jokes, troll a lot, have fun, you know, expose a younger generation to this kind of content as well, because it's powerful stuff. And I found it way too late. Our school systems are failing us. Society sucks. And we have to have each other's backs in the end. So yeah, hit that up. And at the end of each video, I always want to talk about Memento Mori. I got a chain that I wear every single day from the Daily Stoic store, Ryan Holiday store. He's probably the most prominent of the Stoic writers these days. And Memento Mori means, remember you shall die. Sounds grim. What did you expect from a, a channel name like this? <laughs> but uh, anyways, Memento Mori, remember you shall die. And what that does is that it lights a fire under you to pursue your dreams, to make the most of every minute in this world. And despite being in pain for 15 years, I, uh, I can always find strength through Memento Mori to continue to push on forward because this life that we have is temporary, it's precious, and that's about it. Much love to you guys. Peace out till next time.